Thank you, Luke Olson, for taking the time to speak with me today. So to get started, I just wanted you to introduce yourself, your background. I know you mentioned that you have some sort of connection to golf as well, but mainly your background and then from there, how you've gone on this path professionally that you're on right now. So first of all, thanks for having me. Like uh, in terms of my background, uh, I am currently a lecturer in sports psychology at the University of Essex. Like uh, I mainly focus on perfectionism uh, and burnout all of them together. Uh, in terms of my experience more broadly, like uh, I have a very keen interest in sport. Like uh, I played from a very young age, played loads of different sports, uh, athletics, track and field, uh, rugby union, like uh, cricket. But mainly, probably about from about the age of about five, I played golf. Like, uh, and that, if we fast forward a good few years, like uh, I ended up playing in the collegiate golf system in the US. Uh, it failed miserably, like I, I won't pretend. Like, uh, but then that, it gave me probably the first exposure to psychology, having undertaken classes, like, uh, and reflecting on how how psychology and what I learned in those classes. And how that relates to my, my golf performance at that given time. Like, uh, I was probably, uh, well, no, it's not, no probably about it. I was, I couldn't perform under pressure, even if I could strike a golf ball just as well as uh, most other people, like, uh, that were in the field. And my thoughts, like, uh, fear of messing up, worried about being judged, like, uh, my feelings, like, constant anxiety, especially if I put myself in a decent position, like, uh, but then usually, if it didn't go well, I'd feel dejection afterwards. Like, uh, and the behaviours that I would engage in, like as a result of following my psychology, I would take more risks. Like, uh, I would not maybe stick to my routine, like I should do under pressure. And I would have God knows how many swing thoughts changes in a round of golf that probably led to a number of grip changes within putting. Like, uh, which never ended up helping, but I always told myself something's different is maybe always better. Uh, so yeah, from there, like, uh, and getting that initial exposure, I suppose, to psychology, I came back to the UK, like, uh, I mean, like I say, didn't go too well in the States, like, uh, I started an undergraduate degree uh, in, in sport and psychology, like, at the University of Stirling, like, a good golf team as well there, so it allowed me to kind of do both at the same time, uh, I really super enjoyed it, uh, carried on to do a master's in sports psychology, like, uh, and then I'm undertaking now, I'm just about to finish, like, a, a PhD within the discipline of sports psychology in general, but more specifically, focusing on perfectionism, burnout, and also their relationship as a whole. So I suppose the concept of burnout, like, uh, was first recognised in the 1970s, early 80s, and focused on other occupational settings, or business settings, as we might know it as. And it was defined as a psychosocial syndrome, like, uh, which really is just a, a posh phrase for something that's defined by its symptoms, like, uh, and it both has psychological and social attributes. Okay. And if we fast forward a few decades or so, like uh, sort of the early, uh, early to mid 1990s, definitely early 2000s, it was only then was burnout properly studied in sport. Like uh, and apply to athletes as a population, and they took the original symptoms uh, from business and the occupational world, and they adapted them to be more applicable to athletes because they weren't really fit for purpose as they currently were. So Tom Radicki and Al Smith, uh, both in, across uh, North America, decided that the first symptom was emotional and physical exhaustion, and that considers the kind of emotional and physical strain like beyond the norm, like uh, for an athlete. <laughs> the second symptom is reduced sense of accomplishment. And that's the kind of the absence of feelings and competence and achievement, really. Like they no longer feel like they're kind of achieving anything in their sport. Okay. Beyond, again, beyond the norm, beyond acute performance. And the last symptom is called sport devaluation. And that kind of considers the idea that they no longer care about their sport compared to they previously did. And while we're kind of talking about burnout, like uh, while it's commonly viewed in the media and probably the mainstream narrative is that it's an issue that arises from doing too much and it's the kind of the prominent element of like physical, like, uh, like doing too much training, doing, having a congested like, competition schedule, 
actually that's a bit of a myth. Like it's not the case really. And burnout is very much a psychological issue. Like uh, uh, with a lot of researchers in the area highlighting that it is a response to kind of chronic stress, where the individual attempts as a result of that chronic stress to psychologically disengage with their activity to protect themselves really from further psychological harm. Like I mean, they express it by telling themselves that they no longer care about their sport anymore and that their accomplishments maybe don't mean as much uh, and so forth. I suppose that kind of hopefully gives a nice overview of kind of like what burnout is. Uh, maybe perfectionism is a bit more simple to define, but uh, with researchers highlighting there's a personality characteristic, so it's part of your personality, and it comprises of excessively high standards and overly critical evaluations of behaviour. And when I kind of talk about these things, I don't mean just high standards, like uh, but those that are excessive, unattainable standards, and they're ultimately attributed to the pursuit of perfection, which in themselves probably makes them unattainable. Like, uh, mm-hmm. In itself is probably not possible. But, uh, and in a similar way, those kind of critical evaluations are not just kind of reflective of mistakes and what could have gone better, like, uh, which is probably a sign of any good athlete, really. But rather, there's something probably more sinister, where critical evaluations would be disproportionate, or even something that, from the outside's point of view, that it looked, it looked really good. The, the, the golfer made a course, shot course record, won the competition by miles, or came top five and wasn't expected to. But that individual, if they have those hyper kind of critical concerns, they will fixate on the faults. Like, uh, rather than embrace the more positive elements of that activity. They'll figure out, like, oh, I still missed a green, or I still did that, I still three-putted once. And the, what that's fine to reflect, they ruminate, they will not let it go. Like, uh, and it can be thoroughly conducive to a number of different kind of outcomes. It probably comes with more baggage, really, uh, than, than it's kind of worth. And so from there, I kind of wanted to go into... Well, three papers that, that I read, one's called Do Athlete and Coach Performance Perfectionism Predict Athlete Burnout? And the sec- second one was Perfectionism and Burnout in Athletes, the Mediating Role of Perceived Stress. Um, to start with those, can you kind of provide some insights into the findings uh, of those two papers? Yeah, so I'll start with the Does Athlete and Coach Performance Perfectionism uh, predict athlete uh, burnout. Like, uh, and then to set the scene, I suppose it will help. Previous research has tied perfectionism and and then therefore to influence burnout, okay, whereby for any given individual, whether that be a work colleague like a, or a work, someone that's in work, someone that's in education or someone that's an athlete, like a, if they have higher levels of certain perfectionistic dimensions or perfectionism dimensions, it gives rise to their own levels of burnout symptoms. Okay, so perfectionism is tied really to absolute burnout. It's not inevitable, but it's a likely eventuality. And this evidence, like I mentioned, spans across uh, work, education, sport. Uh, I think off the top of my head, there's roughly at least 20 studies in sport that have kind of demonstrated this effect. It's probably one of the stronger effects to be substantiated in sport and does so over time, like a... Uh, but really, that kind of treats it as an individual issue, whereby it's that, that, that athlete's perfectionism, that golfer's perfectionism, and it then influences their kind of burnout. But hopefully, as I touched on earlier with the definition of burnout, it can be viewed as a social issue that arises from interacting with others and maybe the stress they impart on an individual. So intuitively, uh, hopefully, you can imagine that it's quite stressful being around someone who demands perfection. Like, uh, especially if they're in charge of you as a coach, a parent, for instance, and especially if they direct that perfection towards you, they demand perfection of you or at least of others around you. So I kind of took this idea as part of my research, uh, my PhD research, and built off the idea that it's maybe not just an individual issue, maybe it's a social issue. I set out to understand if having a perfectionistic coach can influence an athlete's burnout. Uh, and the study that we allude to is the first from my PhD, like, uh, and found that 
In addition to athletes' own perfectionism dimensions, like uh, when the athlete perceives their coach to be more perfectionistic towards others, probably inclusive of themselves, like uh, in individual sports, this is, they were more likely to experience burnout. So I probably provided the first uh, evidence to suggest that actually the perfectionism burnout relationship isn't just tied to the individual. It is maybe also important to account for other people's perfectionism when considering athletes burnout. Yeah, and that's in something I want to the- touch on later is especially in golf, high-level golf, the team, the coach, the academy, your inner circle, whatever that is for you, how from that, reading that paper, I also learned about, okay, yeah, you need to be surrounding yourself with the, with people that are not fueling and unhealthy expectations. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, that, that, that is something to, some of those people have been less studied than others. Like, uh, the role of parents in the development of perfectionism is important. Uh, and I kind of focus the coach directly attributing to, to their burnout, but the inner circle, like as a wider team, now they're getting bigger and bigger on, on the tour. Like uh, we see more and more people. It's important to probably have similar messages uh, and messages that are more psychologically uh, helpful than to have other mixed messages. And some of those are more psychologically damaging potentially. So, the second study, like, uh, looked at the kind of the mediating role of perceived stress on the perfectionism and burnout relationship. So, I'll put that more simply. Like, uh, it's basically working out why perfectionism in athletes relates to burnout. Like, why is it that high, high levels of perfectionism and dimensions seem to predict uh, high levels of burnout? Like, uh, I understood this fairly recently. Like, uh, and I'm following theory. And the notion that it comes from stress, it seemed kind of obvious to examine stress, uh, which is kind of weird. Over 20 papers have been done, like none of them examined this, like they examined a bunch of other reasons and other factors that may relate to it, but not stress. So I kind of addressed this very small minor gap, I suppose, and collected the necessary data from roughly 250 athletes, like uh, they all filled out questionnaires on their perfectionism, their stress and their burnout, like a... Uh, within in season and found that in fact stress seems to be the glue that ties perfectionism and burnout together where athletes high in worrying about mistakes in particular in their sport experience elevated levels of stress in their sport and then it renders them more vulnerable to burnout symptoms what can you tell me more about the third i guess abstract paper that was specifically looking at golfers yeah, no, definitely. I wanted to consider, does perfectionism kind of predict sport performance? And based on the literature that exists already, it's probably a tricky answer. Like, uh, a research in the past has noted that these excessively high standards may contain kind of performance-enhancing qualities, like, uh, whereas the kind of overly critical evaluations like, uh, are being less relevant to performance. Uh, but the two kind of real caveats with that, or points that you should highlight with that evidence, uh, and this isn't me bashing the researchers, like it's just kind of explaining hopefully where the research uh, literature and evidence base exists and how I kind of built off of it. Like, uh, and kind of one of those kind of caveats is that the previous literature has relied on capturing sport performance without accounting for the athlete's actual ability. Like, uh, so the findings, the idea that excessively high standards maybe breeds or helps performance, it might actually be better explained by how good that athlete is or how good the athletes are rather than their perfectionism in itself. Okay, kind of the sense. second point, I suppose, is the idea of the tasks themselves that we've, we've assessed sport performance. And they sometimes hold less relevance to actual sport performance in real world settings and kind of set focus on tasks, like uh, things like basketball free throw and training, for, in- for instance, and also and capture populations that may not be involved in that sport day in and day out. Like uh, they may play basketball or played basketball before, but they don't train for a team maybe all the time uh, and consistently play. So again, we seem to maybe have like, uh, what is it? Does it actually influence once, once we account for how good these people are? And does perfectionism influence 
objective performance when we we're measuring people that are actually performing in competition. Like, uh, but that so, and, and in, in doing so, uh, I collected data from a high level, like a uh, English, not the English amateur itself, but uh, the North of England amateur, and the uh, and I considered the got gold list to fill up that veteran questionnaire. Uh, roughly within like a month, I think, or maybe a week, a bit of a while ago, uh, to, to complete their questionnaire of perfectionism. And then I tracked their performance in said competition. Okay. And for the sake of it, I just took one round, like, uh, but I could have taken the second round, could have taken uh, the third and fourth round, but there's a cut, so the numbers became smaller. It's harder to kind of ascertain the effects. Uh, so I took the first round and determined that those that are high in kind of striving and, and those and the being like of excessively high standards, uh, the effect on the actual objective sport performance, after I counted the handicap, even if it was super minimal, because I think the average handicap was was pretty much scratch, uh, and the standard deviation was super small as well. But even after I counted for those minor changes, the effect on actual performance, like uh, a dissipated, it doesn't exist. So potentially, it speaks to that idea that it's not a figment of their perfectionism, it's a figment of how good those athletes were okay, in the original study. It's not published, it's just an abstract that went to an international conference in North America through my colleague at Utah State, uh, who I used to know from here. Uh, he studied with me uh, in York. But hopefully we can now turn that into, into some research and a publishable paper that maybe sells the narrative that perfectionism isn't as important for performance, and we really probably shouldn't be fueling it based now on the evidence it has on performance, but then especially because performance is only one slice of the pie, like uh, that it comes with other, other, other slices that are probably more, more detrimental potentially. Like, uh, yeah, so therefore advocating for it for being more perfectionistic. Uh, is not something I would probably recommend. Actually, not probably, I would recommend. So if I'm understanding correctly, from those that research, basically that a, a, a important factor is the actual skill level of the golfer, and that just being more perfectionistic and is definitely not enhancing performance uh, of, of, the, of the golfer or, or the athlete, but it comes with a lot of potential side effects, I guess you could say, that could that could negatively impact performance? Yeah, like I didn't measure those kind of like, those baggage things that could influence performance. I have done it. I, I do have data on this uh, in swimming, but it's not necessarily uh, something that I've kind of considered in the golf environment. Uh, but yes, it is not as relevant to performance. It's not technically bad for performance based off what I found. It's not good for performance, which is probably the kind of the mainstream narrative is that idea. Oh yeah, being more fetishistic definitely helps you. Like uh, mm. it, it gives you that leg up and you, you have to get there to reach the heights of like I don't know, the top hundred in the world in the professional game. But actually you hear of stories of athletes uh, and golfers in themselves that are maybe experiencing perfectionistic fueled outcomes, whether that be burnout or other things. Like uh, that seems to then potentially indirectly influence uh, their performance. But yeah, that could happen. Not something I've done, something I'd love to do, mm -hmm. uh, but not something I've done in any great detail, uh, except from the, kind of like the swimming study that in, involves it. Going back to what we mentioned earlier, perfectionism, there is research on this relationship which you're doing to, to burnout. So the perfectionism, while the narrative is you want to play your best golf, you need to be perfectionistic, that, doesn't necessarily seem to be the case, but perfectionism has an impact on burnout and there can be this perfectionistic tendencies can relate to burnout. And specifically, I wanted you to touch on this two dimension model, three dimension model that you, that is, uh, covered in the papers. Yeah, no, you're pretty much bang on. Uh, perfectionism is related to roughly burnout, like the, the more higher uh, perfectionism dimensions, at least some of them seem to give rise to high levels of uh, burnout, and it predicts it over time. 
Uh, it comes with a load of other kind of factors. Perfectionism has been related to so many kind of athletes' thoughts, feelings, and behaviours, like uh, cognitions around fear of failure, like uh, emotions and more negative emotions, like uh, shame, dejection, like uh, behaviours, they even stop like their activities. Like uh, if if it's not working out for them, or they'll never they maybe procrastinate to the point where they never do the activity or have the SAE or go to the competition out of fear of looking bad, like uh, and being shown up. So yeah, it's related to loads of things. I just focus on burnout uh, as part of my research and kind of extending that that literature and going beyond the individual. But for an athlete themselves, it can pervade loads of different things. I've just published an article. Uh, with with a number of colleagues uh, that I, I kind of co-authored, that interviewed sports psychologists and asked them like, what what is it when you work with perfectionistic athletes? What do they present with? Like, uh, and how is it you work with them? And yeah, in the paper, I hope it'll come out in the next few months. It's been accepted very recently. It comes with a whole host of kind of like problems, or not problems, but difficulties, like uh, that, that sports psychologists have been going to have to try and hopefully address. With, but it also comes with other problems with the sense that these people don't want to let go of their perfectionistic tendency because they think it's actually helped them get there. But they think it's something else that's been called, that's causing their emotional distress like uh, or their mental health problems. So the three-dimensional model, like or Hewitt and Flex uh, model from 1991, so all the way back in 1991, and their viewpoint was that we can capture like a... Uh, excessively high standards and overly critical mistakes together like and it, but it comes in three kind of dimensions of flavors and the first dimension is self-orientated perfectionism and as it sounds it's the idea that the individual demands perfection from themselves they have excessively high standards for themselves and they are concerned over mistakes for themselves so that's the first dimension uh, then the second dimension is other orientated perfectionism. And that this is more outwardly facing like and considers that individual to demand perfectionism from others or perfection from others. And then the third dimension is socially prescribed perfectionism. And that this considers uh, the individual thinks that other people like uh, demand perfectionism from them. So it's a kind of perceived view of how you see the world impacting you and the, the demands you, you think have been placed onto you in terms of being, the need to be perfect, both the excessively high standards and the kind of mistakes that come with it. But, uh, and these dimensions each present a unique pattern like, of, of outcomes for athletes. Some are related to the self, some are related to other people. Like, uh, but generally, if we focus on the individual themselves, those athletes that have socially prescribed perfectionism the ones that think uh, that other people demand performance of them and they can't control that kind of like internalized pressure that seems to relate to worse outcomes for the self like uh, it's related to depression in athletes it's related to uh more to burnout like uh, whereas there is research out there that says self-orientated perfectionism uh could be good or bad in itself um, myself and my colleagues at the part of my research group would argue that no perfectionism dimension is inherently good or bad, like, uh, but rather it gives rise to more beneficial outcomes or worse outcomes or a mixture of the two. Uh, and in the case of kind of self-orientated perfectionism, that idea of striving for perfection for yourself, like, uh, it, it could be classified that some uh, outcomes, it does seem to help, like the better ones. Like uh, um, potentially keeps people plugged in in terms of their motivation, uh, but also uh, it's been found to relate to kind of more poor outcomes as well, like a, like a negative emotional response to foreign failure. And in my case, like a, in the previous like a study that I've spoke about, like self-orientated perfectionism was related to high levels of athletes' burnout, like uh, for that athlete. So potentially again, it's it's neither adaptive or maladaptive in, in itself inherently. And but if we look at the outcomes, there is also a bit of a mixture there. Like, uh, so it's not something equally I would advocate for uh, to encourage based on the existing literature. But then 
the interesting one, I suppose, is other orientated perfectionism to my work, because it focuses on that outwardly demanding perfectionism from others, and it ties really well to that idea of, like, do other people uh, have relevance to athletes and their experiences, because it is that more interpersonal nature. Like, uh, But it's been largely ignored in sport, like, uh, because we have really kind of focused on athletes' uh, perfectionism and how it influences their own thoughts, feelings, and behaviours. But I'm trying to move that literature on, and it, it does exist outside of sport, like uh, in romantic relationships and things like that, and it can potentially be uh, destructive, maybe not personally for the self as much, but definitely for other people being around someone that demands kind of perfection, uh, from either from you or from other people. You touched upon the idea of, like, what fuels kind of perfectionism, like, uh, mm-hmm. or, or really how it develops, and with it being a personality characteristic, it does kind of come from, uh, to some extent, genetics, like, uh, and how your your genes from your, your parents, like, uh, are passed on. I think it's roughly about 15% heritable, like, uh, and the rest of it, where it kind of fuels from, uh, in the evidence so far in the literature, generally says, that those individuals that are around you that you classify as important in your earlier years, your parents, like uh, and in sport, maybe a bit more about your coaches, and what they do or, or how they are seems to kind of feel like uh, how likely you are to become more perfectionistic and display these kind of dimensions of perfectionism. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, and there's, there's like three or four different mechanisms by which this happens. Sometimes it's the child or the, the child athlete, like uh, the junior athlete, they imitate their parents' perfectionism. Or sometimes it's having a parent uh, or a coach that has high expectations, excessively high expectations, and puts pressure. And therefore, that junior athlete then learns that that's what is required to gain the recognition from that coach. Like, uh, and, I, and, and kind of there are two other mechanisms that they're kind of being less uh, researched. So, yeah, it generally comes from other people, like, uh, and it's passed down either through genetics or through kind of like the social environment, like kind of like a whole nature versus nurture. It's not either one, but it's a bit of both. Uh, and they, in turn, then can probably have, it gives rise to a whole host of kind of uh, factors, even for that individual, like uh, never mind when we consider the perfections of other people and that and their influence has on an athlete themselves. So let's move on to the role of stress in all this stress as it relates to perfectionism and burnout and to start with what is this cognitive affective stress model that's mentioned in the in the papers and how does stress play a role in what we've been talking about so far yeah so as we highlighted earlier like i did the article that kind of tied perfectionism to burnout via stress and in that paper i argued that it's we should always try and work out that the relationships or explain the relationships based on theory like uh, and there is a theoretical model uh, inside of sport that suggests that uh, stress seems to give rise uh, to burnout it's called the stress cognitive stress model like a bit of a mouthful uh, from smith and they the bit the take-home message is that burnout develops as a, a response to chronic stress but if i was to give you it in more detail the model highlights that when athletes are phrased an imbalance between the demands of the situation and the ability to perform in a competition, like uh, and then the resources they have available to meet those demands, like uh, they experience stress. Okay, especially when the the demands outweigh the resources. Okay, and there's a, when that imbalance is that way. And we probably know there's loads of uh, factors that seem to contribute towards stress, and it's very common in sport, like. Uh, and it's, but it's managed by how we cope with that stress. Okay, it's just in, in itself it doesn't have to be bad uh, or good. It depends how we manage that stress and the kind of consequences it has. But when we find that these perceived demands like outweigh the resources, like uh, consistently, continually, and then it becomes chronic, so as in we we give rise to this stress on a chronic basis, like it's not just a one-time acute thing then it, people try and have to then cope with that chronic stress that they have. And sometimes they may, they may withdraw from sport altogether because they're like, I'm not enjoying this, this is horrible and horribly stressful. Uh, but sometimes if, if they're still plugged into their sport, 
for various different reasons. Burnout is thought to be one possible reason, like a, as a response to that chronic stress. And, and, as I hope we said earlier, you disengage with that activity to some extent, like uh, and you distance yourself maybe from your sport, like uh, and it, it is reflected in these kind of three symptoms that are experienced. The model has some flaws, like uh, but the broad premise does work, like uh, and does make sense. There's a lot of literature that says stress does, in essence, predict uh, burnout. The underpinning reasons why that happens or why it doesn't, as in why does some people uh, experience stress, uh, chronic stress, don't ultimately lead to burnout, is maybe less well explained. Like, uh, but there is literature that uh, suggests, uh, I can't remember what the exact correlation is, based off of a meta-analysis that was done a few months ago, but it came out, uh, but it was quite a large effect that mm-hmm. like, if you are more highly stressed uh, in your life or, or in your sport, it seems to be correlated quite highly like, uh, with your burnout uh, symptoms. So it seems interesting to me that really it's about not necessarily avoiding stress, but if you're perceiving, you don't have the tools to to deal with that stress, which I could imagine also just thinking in a golf talk context, maybe now it's getting more popular, but how little time is spent from, you know, within the development of golfers is how do I just deal with stress on a golf course as an example, right? Because I mean, if you're playing tournaments, it's stressful. You're not going to be relaxed while you're playing a tournament. I mean, unless you really just don't, don't care at all and you're just being forced to do it, but that's another problem in itself. Um, So I could see how to me that resonated just highlighting the importance of actually we need to equip people with the tools to deal with the stress that they're going to face in golf or in, in other parts of their life, because that's where the, at least from that model, which might have some flaws, it's that there's this perceived, I don't, I perceive, I don't have the ability to cope with what's going on. And over time, that is what is potentially causing this, this burnout because of this accumulation of stress and I'm not able to deal with it over and over and over and over again. So I, to me, I think that's very important also for, for golfers and also for, for golf coaches, which brings me kind of to the next, the last main part before we conclude, which is, okay, we've talked about perfectionism, burnout, but let's also touch on how do we combat these things? Yeah, so combating burnout is super difficult. Like uh, getting these people back from the brink of when they're, if they're feeling really kind of the indicative levels of emotional because exhaustion, reduced accomplishment, support the evaluation. Uh, I think we should highlight it's definitely hard to kind of bring them back from that point. Maybe it's easier to prevent them from experiencing in the first place. But I'm not a practitioner, like, uh, and I'm not probably as well versed in this, in this issue around kind of combating it. But according to like, say, existing research, it is super difficult to kind of combat. And in sport, there's only probably a handful of like studies that have even attempted to do so. Uh, and most have kind of focused on the individual themselves. Like uh, rather than incorporating other people uh, in that experience. Like, uh, so, kind of with that in mind, uh, myself, Daniel Madigan, or led by Daniel Madigan and Henry Gustafsson from Sweden, we published a recent uh, book chapter that highlighted the absence of evidence in sport and maybe the need to kind of look outside of sport uh, in occupational settings to determine what kind of successful or effective strategies exist. And with the intention of borrowing those either directly or at least using them to kind of spark thinking, it's like how could these apply to athletes? And there was a number of kind of effective strategies that we found, like uh, for both the individual themselves taking time off, like uh, or cognitive behavioural therapy, like uh, but also there was broader kind of more like team or social elements. The idea of like providing education around effective communication between people, like. Uh, which speaks to the idea of kind of maybe preventing burnout and stemming from the interacting with other people. But like most things, prevention is probably better than cure. Like, uh, and stress resistance training may help like athletes kind of deal with the stresses like, uh, that they have in their sport and ultimately prevent stress related consequences, one of which is burnout. Yeah. And in this instance, the researchers, I think they're from Germany, like, uh, 
they suggested this idea of uh, stress resistant training, like uh, sounds a very kind of like sexy little side skill, like uh, which includes like a host of kind of strategies basically. It's got eight or ten of them uh, around personal ways uh, to kind of mitigate stress or the effect it has. One of them was, I think, the idea of like preempting si- stressful situations and then effectively planning how to manage that situation and kind of dissipate the kind of effects it has. But if you go to the paper, and there's loads of different effects, uh, they found it to kind of work, but it's not necessarily the easiest to tee down which of the strategies, because it was all done in one go, which of the strategies was most effective, or, or and can it be streamlined, or is it actually the whole package needs to exist in its entirety? And myself, Daniel Lennigan, and a bunch of other colleagues, very, very recently had a paper accepted that tracked burnout over time, like all from all published pieces of research. There's over like 20,000 athletes off the top of my head. And we found that on average, athlete, a number of athlete burnout symptoms are on the rise compared to 20 years ago, like, uh, which suggests that we know more about this subject, but we these people are getting worse. Like, uh, and we're not able to kind of, we're not, we're not doing enough about it, like, uh, and therefore we need to, there's even more reason to, to try and deal with this problem. And I think to me, at least, this idea of stress resistance training sounds interesting. Um, like you said, even though we can't tease out yet what, which are the best strategies, but just, I think even acknowledgement of that could expand the just the way curriculums, instructional programs are even designed. If, if you think, okay, maybe we need to actually incorporate, you know, I'm just thinking from a golf perspective, just adding that element, just hitting golf balls is not necessarily going to prepare me for the stress I'm going to experience as a high level golfer at an amateur level or at a professional level. So I think just that awareness of, oh, I need to start incorporating other elements and we have to do the best to our ability to, you know, rely on the research to kind of guide us in the right direction, even though that's still developing. But that kind of brings me to the next point, which is just from your personal experience and and, and from what you know, any advice that you would have in general for golfers and or golf coaches? Kind of for coaches, uh, not that I want to kind of like ram it down anyone's throat, I don't think that's very fair, but my recommendation would be to encourage like our coaches to to allow golfers not to become perfectionistic, like a uh, or reinforce that perfect and perfect performance is necessary. Like uh, I understand that the world of kind of like competitive sport, like uh, that's harder said than done. Like coaches could be paid based off how well their athletes do, uh, etc. Like uh, but if you're a coach, maybe actually based off the conversation that I've had. It's not actually helping the athlete anyway, even if you are reinforcing those points and the need for perfection. Actually, it's not helping their performance. And it also may be influencing their kind of mental health and well-being uh, in a negative manner. So I would, there are loads of, kind of strategies, but I would potentially avoid setting excessive standards for your golfers. In fact, if, if there's a coach, like uh, it's not helping them. Setting high standards could, like, uh, not something to measure, but that I could see that being uh, like all the much like goal setting potentially quite uh, useful and effective to help people kind of perform and kind of get better. But setting them to be excessive to the point where the unobtainable isn't helping anyone. Like it's just going to stress that athlete out and it also means that they'll never attain it and they're just going to feel constantly like they're inadequate. Like, uh, That's probably also where I found so far it, for golf incorporating um, objective data points of what hyper, like, here's what, on a, you know, a division one golfer does, or here's how good an LPGA player is in this area. If you have objective measures, which nowadays do exist and you compare them to that, and th- that's already a great starting point because if they're exceeding whatever benchmark you're using, okay, you might think I, like, I want you to average four birdies around, but if the best players in the world are averaging two around, that's obvious. That would probably in my opinion be okay we're setting expectations that are just well beyond what is even the best players in the world are doing so how can we expect them to achieve it and that would probably be kind of fueling this perfection perfectionism 
Yeah, definitely. The, the environment, the social environment seems to uh, influence, and you can take objective data to be really useful. Sometimes it's actually to be detrimental, wasn't it? If you're highlighting things and how far you are, what far you are away from the density that doesn't really necessarily help, but it, it gives them clarity to reflect as long as you don't hammer them for it. Like, uh, I always like the idea when I play golf, if I did miss a three, four, five footer or miss a few of them, like for that matter, in a round of golf, going back to the percentages of what a PJ Tour Pro holds of a three, four, five footer, because it's not 100%. And it's Definitely actually not quite, 100%. It's quite, it's quite scarily not even close to 100%, yeah. uh, especially when you get to more of that kind of five-footer uh, yeah. area. So I, I do think having that information provides a more realistic idea. Like, uh, but perfection isn't, is in essence, tangible. Like, uh, so therefore, it goes beyond any kind of standard it's set. It's just the pursuit of perfection in, in and of itself. Like, we could define perfection as like 54, like scoring 54, 18 birdies in a, in a, on a past 72. But that, that, that's, who's that perfection for? Like maybe that's someone that is genuinely perfectionistic, like uh, doesn't see that as perfection. If you're like, oh, I could have eagled the hole. Like uh, mm. I could have done this. Could have hit more fairways. Could have hold the putt. Like uh, could have done more. Like so, therefore, it's not necessarily uh, in of itself a standard. Like, uh, but using that data, real time data, making comparisons will uh, only help potentially temper expectations, I would say. Uh, yeah. And yeah, maybe not fuel that need to be perfect, providing that they're given a realistic understanding about where they're at like, and where they want to get to. And yeah, I think there's loads of things that coaches could do. Like, and my colleague, Michael Grugan, I'll give him a, a shout out goes into some kind of great details around how the coaching environment can be more or less perfectionistic and probably fuel like uh, perfectionism in their athlete. And there's, there's loads of tips that he, ha- that he highlights, but the coaches should be mindful around being not overly critical about mistakes and be mindful to kind of point out good elements, like even if they are minor ones, like even if the, golf- the golfer had a disaster, you still got to, pe- okay, you can highlight and reflect that like, things didn't go well, but you did do this. You can't just hammer someone down and expect them just to all, everyone to bounce back in the same way. Especially if they're perfectionistic, it will only make them mull over it even more. Like, uh, and in a similar vein, we see it quite often in sport because it's just in the nature of it to some extent. But coaches should probably avoid like rewarding individuals when they succeed and on the flip side, punishing those that don't. Like, uh, because you're just reinforcing that good performance is necessary, and that athlete then starts to learn that oh, I've got to really perform it excessively, and then suddenly the standards become not just exceptionally high, or not just not just high, but exceptionally high and excessively high. Like uh, in my mind, so trying to avoid the language you use, the behaviours you might engage in, uh, to not try and manipulate those individuals. But even even if you're very well intentioned. Like, and that can happen. This is not, you, you don't outright punish people just for the sake of it. Like, you do it for a reason, usually, and you think it's because it's going to help them and it's going to build various different uh, qualities about them, resilience, whatever it might be, and pressure training. But actually, you've got to kind of, the underlying message and the subtleties to it are super important. And how, how the athlete construes what you do, like, uh, has a real effect. And it's not just your objective information necessarily. Like what you think you do may, may be really good, but you're not attuned to how that athlete is construing what you've just said. I would advocate for not thinking perfectionistically, like uh, in the first place. And that's hard to said done, isn't it? If I've already said that there's a genetic component and it comes from like early childhood, early adolescence, I mean, you've probably had no real influence on that. Uh, and it's more down to your parents, down to your coaches, down to your genetics. Like, uh, so if you're a bit like me, like, uh, and I've already displayed kind of characteristics when playing golf, like, uh, and it's actually hindering you, my advice would to seek out a qualified sports psychologist or at the, at the least consider reading like a self-help book. Obviously, sports psychologists cost money. Not everyone has access to them. And there's a bunch of self-help books out there that kind of go through activities to try and combat 
your perfectionistic thinking. Off the top of my head, there is one book that has been shown to be effective in influencing those kind of perfectionistic thoughts. Like, uh, I think it's called When Perfect Isn't Good Enough. I think off the top of my head, mm. I can't remember the author. I'll so, look it up and make to include the, I'll include like, the link uh, to it, that. It, it has been shown to be helpful. Uh, and I think it, it's a nice, cost-effective way of potentially managing it yourself if you realize that you are having perfectionistic fueled issues. Like, uh, if you're having the issue itself, probably go seek out help. Or if you think you've just, you've had issues in the past and, uh, and you've not dealt with it, but you're not having current issues, then maybe that book is a nice way to go just to kind of soften any potential future blows that you have in terms of the kind of more maladaptive thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And to go back to your point that you said earlier about coaches shouldn't reward or punish based on, you know, their performance. I think that's also important to make in terms of athletic identity of fueling this idea of, oh, I get treated well when I play well and I get treated poorly when I play poorly. And then my value as a person is dependent on how, what score I shoot. Um, so that's something I've always tried to emphasize is that, or encourage people is like, don't have huge, vic- don't always go out to dinner with your, your parents shouldn't always take you out to dinner every time you have a good round. But then every time you have a bad round, it's silence at home and nobody can talk, you know, either always yeah. go home or always go to go to dinner together after the round. Because otherwise, this is just my, my, my insight at, at, at hearing you talk is that otherwise it, they're going to start associating that, oh, okay, I need to do these, these things in order to be treated well and be liked by people with my family, within my, my golf team. So I think that's a, something that's also important related to, to what you said. I would summarize it, it I, from what I listening to you from the coach's perspective, having realistic expectations and goals. And if you can use data in a, in a good way to actually help the player understand their performance relative to their goal or if they're achieving it and to avoid having unrealistic expectations, that would be a big thing, obviously. And then we talked about treating, not punishing and rewarding just based on performance, because that can have a get cause issues in terms of your athletic identity and also just fueling this kind of potential for burnout and, and perfectionism. And then from a co- from a player's perspective, it sounded like you were saying um, really focusing on being aware and trying to seek out professional help if you, if you have the means to and the opportunities to. But at the very least, if you, uh, that, the book that, that you recommended when, when perfect is not enough, but I'll make sure I get the name right and I'll include the link that has been shown to be helpful um, in, in dealing with that. So seeking out help in some way, whether that's with a person or whether that's in using books or the resources to, to deal with that. Um, and then I guess the same things would apply sort of where you said with parents, you know, the same, same things apply. If you just have excessive expectations and what you're wanting them to achieve. But then the last piece is also, you mentioned that I guess, uh, understanding towards yourself that part of it's genetic and part of it was your upbringing. So if you're listening to this, you're probably already past, you already passed your childhood very likely. So a lot of the stuff has already been put into place. So I think even just an understanding of that can also be helpful and not blaming yourself necessarily like, okay, there's some components here, but I can still make, I can still try and make improvements despite what, what the past might have been. And the last thing I guess I forgot to mention was you covered this idea of stress resistance training um, and exploring ways. And maybe if you're a player, just bring that up with like reflecting like, hey, is my practice actually preparing me to deal with the stresses that just the asking that question is a good starting point uh, to start a dialogue with your coach or w- reflect for yourself and and might help you then start a conversation about finding guidance through coaches or just other resources that just asking that question in itself could potentially already uh, be beneficial. And so the last question really to sum this all up is just, could you provide some insights into current projects you're working on, things you're interested in, and if you had any book recommendations beyond, we kind of touched on one or two books, but if there were any other books, just in general, it doesn't have to necessarily be about this. It could be just books that have been, or papers that have been impactful for you. 
Yeah, so I, I suppose I could grandstand and say, like, read all my work. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to do that. Like, uh, I've, I've got loads of interesting projects on the go. One that springs to mind, obviously, is the study we discussed just now around burnout increasing over time. And we try to sell the idea as to why that's happening and sport and the people around them are seemingly maybe fueling this burnout and their behaviours. That's a super cool little project. On the perfectionism front, uh, I'm taking even a more detailed look about how goalless perfectionism influences performance. So instead of it being the question around is perfectionism good or bad for performance, I kind of more look at, I'm looking at potentially shifting that to when is perfectionism good or bad for performance. Uh, and then the idea of looking at kind of like whole by whole level data, uh, and a colleague of mine is doing that at Utah State from kind of like a books perspective. And if you're interested in perfectionism, uh, and it's not too heavy a read by any stretch, like Andy Hill's, uh, Professor Andrew Hill's book on perfectionism in sport, dance, and exercise provides a great account of what perfectionism is, what it's related to, and towards the end of the chapters, it speaks around how you may deal with it, and it provides some scenarios around what exists, what could exist for athletes, uh, and how you may try and combat that from a kind of practitioner perspective. If you want to go to the kind of burnout literature, Bob Eklund and J.D. DeFries, they provided a nice little book chapter in, in a very big book about sports psychology that goes into a, like a nice little detailed account of what burn, athlete burnout is, like a, and where it, where it comes from, what exists already, where we need to kind of go with that literature. But that's probably a bit of a heavy read for anyone that's not uh, in academia. Thank you, Luke, so much for taking the time to speak with me. And I think it is a really important message. Also, just personally working with golfers, I know there are golfers that I work with that would benefit from listening to this. And I can even think of golfers that openly talk about how they're perfect. They are perfectionistic. So I think if I know a couple of players, chances are there are a lot of golfers out there that um, whether they want to admit it or not are dealing with these things might have a positive or negative outlook on it. But I think your work and what you share today has been really valuable. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed today's podcast episode, consider subscribing to the Golf Performance Newsletter. All the relevant links from today's episode and to my newsletter will be linked below. Thanks for listening and see you next time.